Chesapeake Utilities and Sandpiper Energy, we're, we're very honored to, to be a sponsor of the event today, very honored to be here with you today. Um, we're very pleased. We've got a lot of uh, important partners um, in the room that help us with expansions and economic development. Um, we're very eager, as was talked about earlier, to get into some new footprints here. Um, and um, we're also very pleased to help uh, introduce our next speaker, um, a very important economic driver um, in our, our territory and an innovator in the energy and agribusiness space. Um, Chris Perdue is a fourth generation um, Purdue family member. Um, he is also the spokesperson for Purdue. Um, a very uh, interesting and, and varied um, early career, worked in marketing in the national space in DC and in New York. Um, ran a startup in Silicon Valley for a little while, and currently he is in charge of restructuring Purdue's agribusiness um, division um, here in our area. So please welcome, or please help me welcome Chris Purdue. Um, but good morning, happy to be here. Um, happy to be here on Delmarva. Um, our company's been here a long time, I think. Uh, our family's been here since the 1660s, uh, and then the, the company's about to have its 100 year anniversary um, a little over a year from now in 2020. And the farmhouse on Old Ocean City Road, where it all started with my great grandfather, had its 100 year anniversary. Um, not too long ago, just last year, and so if you drive by there, there's the wonderful historical marker now um, showing that where that was, um, and still is to this day. Um, and also, I figured while I mention it, um, I got married this past year, and so you know when you're doing your census marks and looking at you know all the improvement on the Eastern Shore, I brought you know my wife over from the D.C. area, and she's one of the primary care providers here. So so just make sure you you check that one you know little blip for me. Thanks. Um, but anyway, moving into this, we've been on the shore for a long time. The poultry industry, and I'm going to go through as fast as I can on these slides. The poultry industry started here on Delmarva for the whole um, country, started in Sussex County um, with Cecile Steele selling uh, markets, uh, chickens up to the markets in New York City. Um, and then my grandfather started, my great grandfather started our business with Purdue here in 1920. So there he is in the old, old house on the old Ocean City Road and some of the iconic photos that you all have learned and been been accustomed to seeing throughout the years. Um, today it's still a family owned and operated business. We have four family members that are fourth generation working in the business today. Myself, my brother, um, an uncle and a cousin. Um, we're all happy to be here and we couldn't be happier uh, continuing to grow this company um, that started here locally and now it's a globally uh, run operation. One of the company goals that we have is to be the most, the most trusted name in food and agricultural products, and that all starts with family values that we, we have here on the shore that we've built um, for a long time and we continue to carry, and it goes through our associates um, and their families, which we support over 20,000 individuals and their families, um, and continues today through agribusiness, um, through the grains programs, um, and all the other companies that we're running around the world. Um, but just to, to stick to the numbers, which is kind of why we're, we're here a little bit today, Purdue, by the numbers, um, from a sales perspective, we're the third largest poultry company in the United States. Um, as big as we are, we're still only about 7% of the chicken market here, um, which just lets you know how, how big that chicken market really is. Um, and among uh, grain companies, a lot of people don't realize that our grain division, like the one you see on Zion Church Road here in Salisbury, and as you drive around Delmarva, the grain elevators that you see, we're a top 10 grain company. It's a multi-billion dollar grain company that we have over, over probably about 70 grain elevators around the country um, that we operate, and that's kind of one of the pieces of the business that we don't put on TV and advertise and market, but is, is obviously huge to this area um, and that we continue to grow. Um, associates wise for Purdue Farms, we have almost 22,000 associates across our, our company and our portfolio of companies. Um, we have 2,100 poultry farmers, 600 pork farmers, um, most of those out in Iowa, and then we have um, 8,500 grain farmers around the country. And so if you were to take us, and we are still privately owned, family uh, operated business, but if you were to take us and put us in the rankings of a Fortune 500 company, we'd be right around um, the 350 mark. So we're, 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 we're um, happy to still be in this area and we plan to stick around here for a long time. So um, hopefully you guys are, are happy to have us around. Um, when you have the numbers on Delmarva of what is our local impact here, um, we have about just under 6,000 associates here on the Delmarva Peninsula um, with over 550 poultry farmers in the area, 2,700 grain farmers um, with an economic impact for this area of around $2 billion. Um, just to remind you too about some of our brands that we have. We have the 
Purdue brands on the left side of the screen with our Simply Smart um, and Harvest Land and our Harvest Land Organic lines, which kind of add value to those brands, um, become antibiotic free, veggie fed diets, pasture raised, free range. Um, we own the labels for um, Nyman Ranch. Out in the West Coast, we have Draper Valley with our uh, Ranger and Roxy brands, which are um, kind of premium organic um, labels out there. In California, we have the Rocky and Rosie brands. Um, and then my, um, my brother actually runs some of our pet treat operations. So we have spot farms and full moon pet treats. So if you go into your local Walmarts and Targets and you see those brands, it's fun. You flip it over on the back and it says Arthur Foods Company out of Salisbury, Maryland. Um, we don't put Purdue on there, um, but it's still made with a lot of the chicken from the same plants you can feel. I've eaten all those treats. If you guys want to come over, I'll, you, can, you can have some of the pet treats too. It's all good stuff, um, I promise. Um, trying to keep things moving quickly, we have locations, um, and this is just actually the, the poultry operation locations. We have grain operations in a bunch more states, but you can see we've got operations um, especially east of the Mississippi, but um, throughout a lot of the U.S. We also have offices in um, China and Brazil and the Republic of Georgia. We do grain trading out of Argentina, um, and, and we're just, we're, we're growing like bonkers everywhere, so things are good. Um, but to touch on some economics here real fast, because that's, that's why we're here today, I was told. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the farmers. Um, and the, so so the, we've had some really good grain harvest the last couple of years, really large increases in supplies and what we're carrying over in the grain. Um, but what that's done is that's depressed market prices a little bit. Um, so especially in the, in the story for soybeans here, if you look at global imports of soybeans, that red part of the graph is what China consumes. Um, and recent with some of the trade wars that have been going on and some of the things that have been retaliated against with, with, uh, with Trump, we've lost the Chinese market. And so what happens is when you look at um, exports, we were one of the largest exporters to China um, in the world, the, the, United, the United States as a whole, and Purdue was a big part of that as well. Um, and so when you look at those exports suddenly disappearing as a large part of your market, suddenly you have a lot, your, your supply of soybeans increases dramatically. And what happens when you have a decrease in exports, as you can see here, suddenly your carryover and your stocks to use ratios of how many beans are kind of still left in the tank at the end of harvest or at the end of the year before the next harvest comes has been piling up for us. And what that does is that decreases the um, value of those crops, right? It's simple supply and demand economics. Um, so farmers have been having a really hard time because grain prices have been very depressed. Um, and, and so if you look at soybean prices here, here's where the price chart was. It was in the, I think, 10 to 10.25 range of bushel for soybeans. Then on June 15th, China announced some of their retaliatory tariffs for the soybean market, and you can see how prices then drop dramatically for, for U.S. farmers. So it's tough for a local farmer because you think it's a local farmer farming local crops, um, and you wouldn't think he may be affected by world-level trade wars and economics, um, but it affects everybody at this point. So they had a, they had a significant drop, and when you're talking about a 15% drop in, in your revenue, um, your margins are even a smaller part of that. Um, things get difficult. And so a quick look at just farm production expenses um, against what your expenses are versus your margins that you're making off of that. Um, we're at a point where things are getting tighter and tighter for the farmer. Um, if you look at the margins between the two, your net income versus your cash farm income, um, we, we've got a gap there um, that's dropped to some of the lowest levels that we've seen in over 10 years. Um, so one of the questions that we wanted to talk about today, or, or that we wanted to answer, is what are some of the things that, that we're working with farmers to say, there's some volatility in those commodity markets. Um, world markets are impacting us. What are some of the things that they can do? Um, we've got specialty crop programs that we work with with the farmers. Um, we have plenty of soybeans that we grow with farmers. Um, we've got hundreds of thousands of acres that we grow, and a lot of those beans come here to Salisbury to our soybean crush plant. It's a, it's a healthier oil, oil, has high oleic properties, lasts longer in a fryer, all sorts of great things. We also have a high uric acid rapeseed um, that is used in Jif peanut butter and all sorts of wonderful products. Um, Multi and barleys are organic programs. Um, the point is that these are the conversations that we have with our farmers when they say, you know, we're facing some tough, tough pressures and the commodity markets are getting really volatile. Um, we're doing things the way we've always done them, but we're not 
able to make things meet the way that we used to, we try to show them some of these specialty products so they can start to experiment, um, look at what, what other options are out there, um, things that they can test and learn and get good at and talk to their other farmer friends about and start to grow that insulate them from your commodity markets, right? Because a lot of these other specialty products have a little bit more of a inelastic um, pricing curve to them. Um, so that's kind of the, the grain side real fast. Um, if we want to look at poultry markets, poultry farmers um, and how trade wars have kind of affected us a little bit on that side. Um, we've, had a, we've had a trend in the United States in the last many years of increasing the number um, of pounds of, of chickens produced and the number of head processed in the United States um, for a while now. Um, and what that does is it, is it means that there's an excess amount of poultry on the market. Um, and the chickens are, are also getting bigger. If you look at the average live weight of chickens since 2001, um, we've been growing bigger chickens. Um, to even make a more dramatic point, <laughs> these are kind of your live market weight processed, processed chickens um, of what it looked like in the 50s versus today of, of in the same amount of time of how much does a chicken weigh by the time it comes to the live market weight. Um, and so when you add that on top of pork production and beef production, all of which are up, um, we've had a significant growth in supply. Um, the supply of meat and poultry in the last three years has grown by about 8 billion pounds in the United States, which is about 25 uh, pounds per capita. Um, or, or sorry, per, per capita, or 8.3 8 pounds per person per year. Um, over the past 40 years, that consumption average is typically about three quarters of a pound per year. So we're growing at a much larger rate than consumption is actually growing. Um, and so there's, there's some impacts to, to um, our markets that especially once you have some of these trade wars and things flare up, um, start to get impacted. Um, and so what ends up happening now is we've got freezers where we have excess volumes of meat for poultry um, and beef and pork that are going into freezers because they can't find homes for them. Um, so you can see um, beef is, is actually doing okay. They, and I'll get into this in a second, but, but when prices start to go down because there's an excess, people like to upgrade what they're eating um, and go towards more beef and, and, and cheaper products that previously were, were viewed as more premium. Um, so beef storage is about the same, pork is about the same, but you can see chicken is the red line here. Um, all of 2018, we've been at record levels of, of poultry in the freezer um, this whole past year. Um, so again, to keep moving quickly, this is a chart that shows activity, feature activity. So this is um, what's on promotion, what's at discount at stores, what are they trying to move, get people to buy. Um, so you can see that beef feature activity is actually above average um, compared to normal historicals um, because, again, as prices go down, people want to upgrade what they're experiencing, what they're able to bring home to their families, what they're going to be cooking for dinner. Um, and so people will then focus more on some of the red meats. Um, pork gets... Um, it's about average, it's, it's a little bit flat year over year, but then you look at the poultry feature activity and we're way out of the normal deviation zones. Um, there's just a lot of poultry out there on the markets and it takes us, I think, the whole industry about 18 months to smarten and wise up and look at what everybody's doing and say maybe we should, we should pull back a little um, and not flood the market. So um, long story short, where this all nets out for the ag industry and for poultry as a whole is the chicken change, uh, the change in chicken prices year over year um, looks at a total decline in market value when you put all those pieces of a chicken kind of back together into a whole chicken. Um, it's very complicated economics. Um, it, it, it looks at about, about a 20% market decline in value for each one of those chickens that are getting produced. Um, and that's, that's tough for us, it's tough for the farmers, it has a ripple effect all the way on down for everybody, um, even to the grain farmers who are also getting hurt. And a lot of those grain farmers are also chicken farmers. Um, so we're trying to keep them whole and keep everybody um, fluid as we're going through this. So one of the ways, and there's a lot of ways in which Purdue as a company is, is combating this, making sure that we're going to you know, stay ahead of these things and these trends, trends and these changes. Um, so I'm not going to talk about everything that we're doing, but one of the things that we're doing is, is we're gonna, you know, we want to we wanna insulate ourselves a little bit more um, from these volatile commodities, from some of these um, markets that can swing wildly um, in different directions. Um, so the way that we're thinking about this is that there's kind of an elevated attribute that, that I've put up here that kind of goes from 
The store chicken that you can buy in the grocery store that you kind of don't know what brand it is, where it came from, it's in the clear tray in the middle aisle, BOGO kind of stuff um, that you don't really know where it came from, but you can get a lot of it for a cheap price, all the way up to um, the top end, which is heritage breeds, pasture-raised, slower-growing chickens, much more expensive to raise. Um, and so we, we have a strategy that we've been trying to elevate what we're doing, and that's kind of in our blood in our, uh, the way that we're, we're cut as a company and as a family, that's what we've always done is wanted to take it to the next level um, and see what do consumers want and how we can get it to them. Um, so our, our core Purdue brand used to be at the top of this tier um, back in the day and we still are elevating it and making it better than everybody else as much as we can, um, but there's a lot more ground that we can go. So we have the, the Purdue level, that's our veggie fed, um, Purdue uh, process verified program, no antibiotics um, that we have in the middle there, going into uh, no antibiotics ever. Then we get up into some of our Simply Smart organic programs um, that are some of the free range programs, our, our uh, access to the outdoors, again, veggie fed, value added simple ingredients. We elevate those into the Coleman brands, our Harvestland organic brands with USDA certified organics. Then we have some of the local free range, non-GMO diets as well. Those are some of our brands on the, on the West Coast with Rocky and Rosie. Then we have some of the ultra premium kind of local USDA certified organic with our Roxy. Um, sorry, there's Rocky and Ranger, then this is Roxy and Rosie. There's too many R's. Um, and then at the top, we have some of our Sonoma Red brands, which is a heritage breed pasture-raised bird. So these are all areas that we are elevating, exploring, and pursuing. Um, and part of the reason why is when you look at kind of that market size and pricing volatility, you have this conventional market at the bottom that swings um, with a lot of different market conditions. Um, and there's a lot of volatility down there. And as you get more elevated with higher attributes and a more premium product, there's much more stability in those markets. Those don't swing nearly as much. Organic grains are not traded on your typical Chicago Board of Trade um, or CME markets. Um, and, and so there's much more stability there. Um, organic as a, as a segment is growing um, rapidly in the country by double digits every single year. Um, for us, it's, it's been a 20 plus, 30 plus percent growth area. Granted, those are percentages, right? And it starts with small numbers, so it can still sound really good, but it's still growing significantly for us. Um, on organic sales across the entire sector um, are over at $50 billion, not for us, but across the whole organic sector across the United States. Um, so again, one of our tenets and goals um, as a company is to be the most trusted name in food and agricultural products. And, and one of those wonderful things is that organic and a strategy in organic for us plays into that. Organic means trust and transparency in where this animal came from, how it was raised, what it was fed, and what that means to a consumer as they buy that in the store. Um, Unfortunately, Purdue's already in a position that, that America trusts Purdue as a poultry producer. We're the most trusted name in poultry, especially in the Northeast markets where we've had a long time being there. Um, so we're positioned well to be the leader in this space and we're the number one organic brand of poultry um, and the producer in the United States already. Um, so at the end of the day though, what we have to do with organic in order to grow in this space is, is we have to address some of these consumer concerns about how do they access these products and how do they get there. Um, and, and so some of the concerns like I can't afford it, we need to make it pricing um, through sourcing organic grains through our agribusiness division, through investments like at Trade Point Atlantic in Baltimore or Sparrows Point with an organic facility to be able to bring organic products to the market more cost effective than anybody else can do it so that you all can afford it in the grocery store. Um, they say they can't find it. Um, can't find it. Right now we're rolling out organic products, especially in the freezer section with our Simply Smart Organics line nationwide um, at affordable prices for everybody. Um, we don't have what you want because there's limited selection. We're increasing varieties, trying to get more out there, um, and the taste is better. We have, we have quantified um, panels from our sensory testing um, and other locations that, that talk about um, how people actually prefer it in blind taste uh, studies over conventional chicken. Um, so our Purdue Harvest, uh, Harvestland Organic, we have a full line of chicken there from raw to um, um, shortcuts and other value added products like we have here with our Simply Smart Organics line. Um, I know Jamie Hayes in the audience, her, her girls only eat our products, so thank you for your part. Um, but we're, we're rolling out some new ads for these two advertising the Simply Smart Organics, um, going to be rolled out nationwide. So um, long story short, you know, it, it, the markets are, are pushing us you know, to thinner, thinner and thinner margins. Farmers are having a hard time, um, but we're trying to explore more value-added opportunities with more specialty products um, to find ways to get things to consumers that they want and they need in an in affordable uh, direction. 
So that's it for us. Thanks.